Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Amy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and also, as I said earlier to Amy, uh, for including me as part of Blue Island uh, Library's excellent public programming. Those are events that I would love to, to hear more about and to be a part of. Um, but as she mentioned, my talk tonight is going to be focused on Chinese food in the Midwest. And I kind of will break that down later into kind of three different historical periods. One that we call the Chinese Exclusion Era, when immigration acts largely barred many Chinese immigrants and Chinese Americans from forming families and having citizenship rights here in the United States, into a later era in the last half of the 20th century that we might call Sino-American Reproachment, when Chinese Americans were largely embraced by mainstream America through wholly positive stereotypes about them as being a model immigrant, as hardworking, as well-educated, and as assimilated to mainstream values and politics. And then a later era that really has just started in the last four to five years in which I see Americans as very, very kind of anxious about our economic, our political, and our relationships to the People's Republic of China, a rising superpower in the 21st century but also our relationships to Chinese Americans and immigrants in the Midwest and also their food. And so much of tonight's talk on food is actually centered on how it kind of represents things like uh, the Chinese American and Chinese immigrant identity and also like what it says about their culture and their place in America. And why do historians study Chinese food? Well, we do it really to look at the lives of Chinese Americans and immigrants. And why this is particularly valuable for historians like myself is because it's a way to kind of break apart all these assumptions that we have about the Midwest, Midwestern states like Iowa and Illinois and Minnesota and over here in Indiana or back when I was in Ohio, as a place that's insular, as a place that's homogeneous in terms of culture, but also in terms of race as a place that's populated only by white or Anglo-Saxon Americans. And the ways in which we can do that is by refocusing history on people that are often marginalized or excluded. In this case, in particular, Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants, and to bring their voice into Midwestern history. And also to look at the kind of really important roles that they play as intermediaries between the US and China. And if you like this type of analysis and you like this type of history and you wanna learn more about Chinese Americans and Chinese food and its history, I really strongly suggest a book that was just published in 2020 called American Chinese Restaurants, Society, Culture and Consumption. It was edited by scholars like Jenny Ban and Haiming Liu. Uh, my chapter on Chinese American food and Chinese Americans in Ohio from the exclusion era to the last few years is included, and it's called uh, which is talk doesn't cook rice, which is kind of this old adage that says uh, embodies the spirit that really food and the people that make food have to engage in a lot of action, a lot of cultural diplomacy to pursue things like the American dream, to protect the Chinese American community in the United States, and also to assert the kind of brilliance and sophistication of their food and culture that sometimes in American history has been denigrated by racist stereotypes. Particularly in the 19th century, a lot of people held an impression of Chinese food as something that was unhealthy, as something that was often produced in kind of filthy circumstances, or by people who were unclean, or as a food and a culture that was relatively unsophisticated or uncomplicated in comparison with other cultural traditions from, say, Europeans. And if you like this work, uh, you can find lots of really interesting people like Samuel King working on these topics. Samuel King, and for instance, writes about uh, the history of a Chinese American restaurant in Chicago that I'm gonna talk about here in a second. Haiming Liu has a whole book on the history of Chinese food and dishes like chop suey. Scott Seligman focuses on a history of Chinese Americans in Indiana, some of which became very, very impressive, powerful political figures in the early 20th century. 
Hong Yun Yong also writes about this immaculate Chinese restaurant that was built in the early 20th century in Milwaukee, which is really, really interesting. And then if you're just interested in things like pork, to me, pork is a really interesting uh, vehicle that acts as a cultural bridge between Midwesterners and Chinese Americans and also China and Chinese immigrants, because pork is this really, really important thing in Chinese culture. Uh, and scholars like Sam White have talked about how the pig uh, has become globalized, a variant of the pig and swine from China suddenly makes its way across the world in the last two centuries and becomes very, very important to our industrial economies. So if you like studying pigs and how they came to populate the American landscape, Sam White's work is really interesting. So those are really the motivations of why we look at Chinese food and its history. It's important to industrialization. It's important to diplomacy. It's important to the development of the Midwest. And it's really important to restoring to the historical record, people like Chinese Americans and immigrants and their businesses, such as restaurants and groceries, that have always been right there alongside us in the Midwest since the 1880s, since the enactment of immigration laws designed to exclude them. And so how did they survive? Well, they survived by inventing new dishes like chop suey. But increasingly today, they don't want to invent new dishes. They want to bring with them really, really authentic dishes. But when I first started looking at Chinese Americans, I looked at that exclusion era from the late 19th century on through the Second World War, when those laws were repealed in 1943. And I focused on figures who survived by presenting themselves as spokesmen for the Chinese American community. And when I was living in Ohio, I focused first on men like Charlie Yi who was known as the mayor of Cincinnati's Chinatown. And Charlie Yi was this person who was able to found businesses in Cincinnati in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s and 1950s, such as the Shanghai Inn, that attracted all kinds of non-Chinese white Midwesterners, politicians, judges, civic leaders. And in fact, it's in his restaurant and its entertainment offered at night, that famous actress and singer Doris Day first got her start inside Cincinnati and then went on later to Hollywood fame. Now, as he was successful economically and successful socially in using Chinese food and dishes like chop suey to socialize with the rest of Cincinnati, he also was able to use people's interest in Chinese food and himself as mayor of Cincinnati's Chinatown to raise tens of thousands of dollars for China's war relief. And when he retired in the 1950s and 1960s, he was praised by media and newspapers such as the Cincinnati Enquirer as somebody who had fulfilled the American dream. He'd been a commercial success. He'd had his own businesses. He was a civic leader and thus, he fulfilled all these things that defied exclusion, all the reasons why in earlier periods, Americans had argued Chinese were unfit to be members and residents of the United States. And so he's kind of cel celebrated as, uh, as a person who's fulfilled everything one could want in his life. Now, underneath all that is a lot of Charlie Yee's persistence against racial stereotypes, against harassment, against economic poverty. Uh, in fact, it's Charlie Yi who in the wake of the attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor, he quickly runs over to a person who's able to print and uh, impress messages on buttons and pins in Cincinnati. For all of the Chinese and Chinese Americans living in Cincinnati, he makes all these buttons that say, I'm not Japanese, I'm Chinese. Uh, so, Yi's story isn't just a success story. Underneath it, if we probe harder as historians and as people looking at the past, it's much more complex. It's a lot of hardship that he was endured as well. And if we survey the Midwest, what's interesting is we can find men who lived lives very similar to him that we can put back into the uh, historical record. 
Men like if we go to Indianapolis, we would find Moy Key, who also was a restaurant owner in the exclusion era, who first came from Guangdong, China, Southern China to New York, where he sold newspapers. And then he was converted to Christianity and sent actually as a Chinese pastor and a Chinese missionary, and then later made his way to Chicago in the early 20s, or in the early 1890s, where he worked as a court interpreter and then eventually founded his own restaurants and tea houses. Now, he is particularly impressive to historians because he was one of the only Chinese in the Midwest, in the exclusion era, to win naturalization in the U.S. courts. He actually won a case that confirmed he was eligible for citizenship, and bestowed all the rights of American citizens on him. Not only that, he won honors from the Qing Empire back in China, where he was then visited by a famous royal member of the emperor's family, Prince Pu Lu, in 1904, and given honorary titles. So he's wealthy. He founds this enormously impressive restaurant peddling chop suey and other Americanized Chinese dishes in the early 20th century. But he, like Charlie Yi, illustrates some of the peril as well. Because in the 1910s and 1920s, he runs into all kinds of hardships and disasters. His titles are revoked by the Qing Empire, who feel that he's actually working with all these revolutionary movements, such as Sun Yat-sen, Song Dongshan's revolutionary movement to overthrow the Qing Empire and establish a Chinese republic. So they take his titles away from him. He's no longer a cultural ambassador for the Qing Empire. And then when he tries to make a return trip to the United States after visiting family, he's actually denied entrance and detained despite being a citizen for five weeks. Him and his wife aren't allowed to return to Indianapolis. They languish in this kind of jail and encampment for five weeks before they're eventually allowed out, only with the help of Indianapolis politicians, such as the mayor. But even then, he runs into further disaster. A U.S. federal court decides that since he's Chinese, he can't possibly be a citizen. So his citizenship and his rights, such as the vote, are ripped away from him. He later dies in the 1920s on the verge of economic collapse. Then if we shift to Chicago, we find another figure, Chicago's Chin Foyn, who had a very similar business, who also broke down barriers and was a spokesman for his community. Chicago's Chin Foyn, he was actually able to use Chinese food to market as an upscale dining experience. And in Chicago in the 1910s and 1920s, his business, like Charlie Yee's, attracted all kinds of well-to-do whites. Doctors, lawyers, politicians, mayors, and he uses chop suey as kind of an elegant experience. And in doing so, he was actually able to resist housing segregation in Chicago that tried to bar Chinese from living in communities amongst other whites. He was able to break down all kinds of social barriers to where he could go with his wife, who's pictured here with him, and all kinds of narrow, negative stereotypes of Chinese American food as kind of low class. But he too runs into peril in the 1920s and 1930s. He dies in an accident and his wife is able to manage his business for a while before being forced to sell the restaurant off in Chicago and return with her family. And then if we shift over to Des Moines in the same era, we find King Ying Lo, which is one of the longest running Chinese restaurants in America from 1911 to 2009, which has now been replaced, but honored by a very, very famous pizza place, which I'd be interested to know if anyone in the audience has had when visiting Iowa known as Fong's Pizza. It's been in a lot of national media the last few years because they make a pizza known as Crab Rangoon Pizza. And more recently, uh, a pizza that features Fruity Pebbles, the popular cereal item. But for decades and decades inside Iowa, it was King Ying Lo at this restaurant site. And that was first established by Li Din, who also, like the rest of our people, Charlie Yi and Moi Ki, came from Guangzhou and then traveled to St. Paul, Minnesota, and then arrived in Iowa in the early 1900s and 1910s, where his business thrived. He made endless amounts of money that he sent back home to pay for his son and his daughter's education even. And he also used it to launch an import and export 
a bank, and also a brokerage firm. So all kinds of businesses back home. Enough so that he was able to retire in 1924 and return to reside with his family. So very, very successful. He sold the business off to several different Chinese American families that continued to run it throughout the rest of the 20th century. And even their descendants still live in Iowa in Beaverdale, where they run a new restaurant known as the Rice Bowl. So that story of survival, that story of using Chinese American food as a way to embrace the larger Midwestern community, but also to fight for the rights of people, that's something embodied by each one of these men and in each one of these places around the Midwest. Uh, the first owner of King Ying Lo, Li Din, was often known to stand up for laundry workers that were Chinese. He also used his uh, uh, business to found uh, to be a base of operations for many different leftist groups in Des Moines, such as socialists would often hold speeches and rallies at King Ying Lo. And then lastly, we have Milwaukee and Toys Towering Restaurant. Here we have a six-story Chinese restaurant built in the exclusion era that included a stage and theater that could house as many as 415, 450 people, as well as a bazaar in the middle of the restaurant area that featured imported silks and other items from China. So here, this is a restaurant owned by the Toy family, a Chinese American group in the exclusion era. It too runs into problems in the 1930s and 1940s. And one thing that I would like to stress tonight that needs further exploration is in the 1920s and 1930s, two things really change how Chinese Americans serve food and run their businesses. The first is prohibition, which a lot of people patronized a lot of Chinese American restaurants in the 1910s because they were open all night and because they would also be places where people could drink, play cards, and fraternize with their friends. In the 1920s, after prohibition, uh, a lot of them start to become speakeasies, and some of our Chinese Americans stop to part, part, uh, pop up in the historical record and newspapers as bootleggers and moonshiners, which is really, really fun to study. The 1930s, though, also hits restaurant owners of any kind very, very hard, but especially Chinese Americans, who, despite amassing fortunes early in the 20th century, like the toys, are forced to close down these beautiful establishments and fine dining arenas that had started to peddle a lot of Chinese dishes to kind of upper class white Midwesterners. Uh, toys will eventually be demolished, and they're forced to move their restaurant into a spot a smaller restaurant spot above a Walgreens in Milwaukee. Okay, now that's all about what's happening in the exclusion era, but a lot of my chapter and what I kind of want to continue talking about tonight, sorry, I'm just checking the sign, is about what happens after the Nixon visit to see Mao Zedong in the early 1970s, and a period that historians call Sino-American Reproachment, where diplomacy, immigration, and more positive relations between Washington and Beijing are restored over our course in the 1970s and 1980s. And the change in America's immigration laws beginning in 1965 with the Immigration and Nationality Act open up much larger volumes of Chinese Americans and immigrants to come to the United States. And that story also coincides with a shift in Chinese American food and Chinese American restaurants that moves from highly Americanized dishes like chop suey towards restaurants such as Mike Wong's here in Cincinnati and Kentucky that focus on regional cuisines such as Sichuan and prefer to give to Americans more authentic foods. And with these people coming from the 1970s on through the rest of the 20th century, we not only see new types of food, Sichuan is known for being very, very spicy and very fragrant and full in flavor versus kind of the more sugary or sweeter or fried dishes that we got earlier in the 20th century at a lot of Midwestern Chinese American restaurants. 
We also see shifts in the patterns of immigration. Now it's not just men coming to the United States from China, it's people enacting what we call chain migration, pulling over wives and children to form fully complete nuclear families inside the United States. Not only that, because Americans are looking upon China more favorably in the 1970s and 1980s as a potential trade partner and as a place that Americans want to understand as tourists, as students, but also understand through the people that represent China, such as Chinese Americans and immigrants in their community, we start to see new institutions founded. Uh, Mike Wong is going to become one of the founders of the Chinese American Association of Cincinnati, but also help Cincinnati establish sister cities relationship and promote trade between Cincinnati and cities and regions within China. And also he'll become a founder of the Greater Cincinnati Chinese Chamber of Commerce. As this is happening, you get Ohio politicians, starting with Governor Jim Rose and his trip to China and the Great Wall in 1979, promoting what I call a very implicit bargain. And that is that if Americans are willing to embrace regional, authentic Chinese cuisine, such as that offered by Mike Wong, they say that this will deliver a lot of things to Ohioans, particularly at a time when Ohioans as well as many other Midwestern states are worried about flagging industrial economies and a flagging agriculture sector. Here, think especially of states like Iowa in the 1980s where they're hard hit by natural disasters and also deflating agricultural commodity prices. So here you have politicians saying, if we're willing to understand China, if we're willing to embrace Chinese Americans, and multiculturalism, this will open up doorways that will strengthen ties to the People's Republic of China, and this will save us. So it's almost like uh, a political purpose behind a greater diet and diversity in foods. And through this, Wong is able to achieve for his family and bestow upon his daughters who go on to take over many of his businesses across the Ohio region, the American dream. They're embraced as a model minority, as hardworking, well-educated people who are successful socially and economically, but also as people who are valued members of the community and spokesmen for Chinese and Chinese Americans alike. So they fulfill the American dream. Now where things get really interesting, which is the last part of my chapter, is looking at the dynamics of what's happening with immigration and Chinese food in the United States today, in the last five years to the present moment. And that's really where things shift. If you start to look at where Chinese are coming to the United States and settling, it's not in big urban areas like Cincinnati or suburbs as much as it is college towns. College towns like the small town of Oxford, Ohio, which since 2008 has seen a rapid influx of international students. And along with that, Chinese-owned businesses, not just restaurants, but residential housing and apartment complexes, groceries, entertainment and clubs, and even a fitness center now in Oxford, Ohio. And it's completely changed the social landscape. Out go mm, American chain enterprises like Quiznos and Subways. Those go away from downtown. In income, a series of Chinese-owned restaurants like Tong Dynasty and Yum Yum and Chun Shi Kitchen, whose menus are all printed in Mandarin and whose consumers are almost all exclusively Chinese international students. And on the one hand, small towns like Oxford, Ohio, since that time, have had civic leaders like the Chamber of Commerce embrace these people as a massive influx of not just people, but investment in the local economies. But on the other half, though, you've started to see people get really anxious, in part fed by American politicians, such as President Donald Trump and his rhetoric of America first but also for an even longer period, like Ohio Congressman Sherrod Brown or Rob Portman, 
some concerns and some anxieties that perhaps Chinese are getting more out of their relationship with Ohio than they're giving to the local Midwestern economy. There's a lot of racial tensions. There's a lot of class tensions. These Chinese international students coming to the United States are often well-educated, wealthy, and don't want to see themselves pursue the American dream, but instead patronize these businesses and their owners like Xiao Hui, Zhou Yang, see themselves as fulfilling the Chinese dream, which is a reference to the political ideology of China's premier, pictured here, Xi Jinping a reference to China becoming a global superpower, projecting influence around the world and rivaling the United States economically, but also ideologically. And so here I'm saying that the food around uh, the food being proffered by Chinese American businesses and Chinese immigrant owned businesses is being read and interpreted differently. It has kind of a dual meaning. Some people embrace these businesses like Tong Dynasty, which offer a lot of really authentic Chinese cuisine that hasn't been changed or altered to mainstream American taste. They embrace it because to them, it still means multiculturalism. It still means strengthening ties to the People's Republic of China. And it still means an embrace of Chinese Americans and immigrants in our communities. But at the other time, you see people becoming anxious. They are fearful about these things because they also represent a China that is a rival to the United States. And Chinese immigrants that perhaps have enough wealth, education, and influence to not only resist assimilating to Midwestern values, or dominant culture, but have no desire to do so, have no desire to really integrate themselves into these communities, in part because they feel like their own culture and their own ways, and especially their own food, is just as good, if not superior, to Midwestern American fare. So that's where I leave things. That's where I really want to see what's happening in this next historical era, because I feel like just like the exclusion era came to a close in 1943, and you saw Chinese American restaurant owners like Charlie Yi use chop suey, but also other Americanized dishes to transition from being excluded and marginalized to becoming mayors and people seen as representing the American dream. You're seeing another era close and a new one begin. And my questions are really, how will the rest of America respond to a generation of Chinese immigrants who own businesses and are powerful, rich, and project influence? And how will America respond if these people no longer need to cater to non-Chinese to become naturalized citizens, investors, businessmen, or just really, really influential consumers because of their wealth? Other questions have come since I finished this chapter for this book, which I really, really recommend. Uh, not because my chapter is so good, but because if you read the other chapters from people I've mentioned, like Samuel King on what happened with Chicago or Hong Yun Yang in Milwaukee in Chinese food, is how all the recent stories of anti Asian hate since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic has altered the meanings associated with Chinese food and what it represents. And what then with rising violence and hostility towards Chinese Americans and China are the historical parallels between today and how we look at Chinese food or how we treat immigrants or how we treat Chinese Americans and the exclusion era. So how are things continuous in history and then how are things different? Uh, and now, if I could, I'd really like to open it up to questions for the audience. And if I could make a request, if you would not only introduce yourself with your name and your question, but your favorite uh, Chinese or Chinese American dish. Uh, my favorite uh, dish to name one is Dan Dan Mian, 
which is like these really, really spicy noodles from Sichuan cuisine. I just love noodles. I can eat them anytime. And even people that really don't make it in a way that I'm familiar with, I just love having it at whatever Chinese American restaurant I go to. So I thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. I'm just going to pop on really fast and let people know as <laughs> I was typing this in the chat, but you can unmute yourselves um, in Zoom if you want to ask your question in person, or um, if you don't, you can type it in the chat and either myself or Dr. Miller can read it out. Um, up to you, dealer's choice. Um, Mogu Guy Pan here. <laughs> uh, I have a Seen, I've seen some interesting articles about uh, immigrants, first and second generation, about what the families did to make a living when they come to the country. You know, Greeks, Germans, Vietnamese, um, different Middle Eastern countries, and then what the second generation does after that. And many of the kids and of course, many of those immigrants made a living with restaurants or grocery stores. And the kids decided, well, I've watched my parents work 80 hours a week, seven days a week for my entire life. And I'm going to college and now I'm going to go off and I'm going to be a physician or a dentist or whatever. Um, you have any idea what research shows about Chinese people, Chinese families? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think a lot of uh, historians of immigration have the exact same kind of comparative uh, analysis that you would be interested in. So in terms of statistics, I can't really comment, okay? But I can point you to some anecdotal uh, experiences that I think answer that question. One is uh, the editor from this volume, Jenny Bond, grew up uh, a second generation Chinese American her parents had a Chinese American restaurant in St. Louis. And so kind of the same thing that she's told me of like, I grew up in the restaurant. So I went to school after school, my parents were working, running the restaurant. I would be there with my siblings and we would hang out in the restaurant and do homework or have fun, play games, help with the restaurant. And that really inspired her to go on and do something else. And her parents really wanted her to do something else. Another good book that talks about kind of a similar trajectory is called American Paper Son. And it's a biography by Wayne Hung Wong, who grew up in Wichita, Kansas. And his father um, brought him to the United States to work in a restaurant. And then he continued working in the restaurants after serving in the U.S. military during the Second World War. And then his generation, which are his sons and daughters, which would have been third generation, were all sent off to get college degrees to make that transition. I think that kind of uh, aspiration, a lot of Chinese American restaurant owners to see their sons and daughters go on and do something else is really strong. And I think we see that model. Of course, that's not the story for ev everyone. You know, like we have Wayne Hung Wong's because he got enough of an education to write his own biography. And we know what happened to Jenny because she's a scholar herself. So there's a lot of people that I don't think um, necessarily uh, move on to other careers. They take over the restaurant. They assume those things. A third thing that's really interesting that's happening right now, is it Bob? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a lot of the restaurants that I referenced in Oxford, Ohio, uh, that were founded, like Tong Dynasty, those are owned and operated by young men in their 20s and 30s who are using their restaurant experience in the United States as kind of a testing ground to then go back home and run restaurants. Almost every one of the cooks, managers, and owners of those businesses that I talked about, their goal in life was to test out 
their experience in the United States and then go back home and open one or several restaurants back in China. So they definitely want to stay in the restaurant business. It's almost like an apprenticeship in the United States. They're serving their fellow students in the Chinese American community there. And then their, their ultimate goal is to go home and be a restaurant owner still, even despite having a college education. Okay. Yeah. I saw someone in the chat uh, said, love dim sum, hard to find it. Where I live in Middle Tennessee, Memphis was a great place for dim sum. Do you know anything about Chinese food in the Tennessee area as well? I don't as much, but I can recommend with Tennessee, I don't as much. There was a great uh, story that I used for one of my classes last time uh, on Chinese American families living in Mississippi. And I'm gonna put the link to that uh, in the chat room here in just a second. And it talked about uh, some of their experiences of these generations of Chinese Americans who were originally brought over to work on plantations to help produce things like uh, a cotton plant in the late 19th century and their descendants who have remained in states like Mississippi uh, by running groceries and restaurants. And it kind of talks about their experiences, but also like the fusion of Southern food with Chinese food, which a lot of uh, Chinese food that originally comes over in the exclusion era is also Southern Chinese food. So um, I think that would be uh, perhaps of interest uh, to our audience member from Tennessee. And so I put that in the YouTube link. It's a really, really interesting story. In particular, one of the things that jumps out to a lot of people is you have to listen to um, these Chinese American women's accents because they talk about how stunning it is for people to hear their very, very deep Southern American accents. And then also to see them as Chinese Americans. That's kind of dumbfounding. Oh, can I ask a question? I guess, well, my favorite dish that I ever ha had was um, like a lotus fruit at a Szechuan restaurant, but I don't know what it was called. It was like an appetizer and it was really good <laughs> in Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah. At the time. Um, but my question um, has to do with the rise of like the model minority. Um, Appalachian, is that the right thing? You know, like, you know, association with Asians. Can you talk a little bit more about how that arose? And I mean, and now there's like some backlash against that from other Asian groups that say, you know, not everyone is, you know, doing as well economically and stuff in the US. Can you talk about that? Or is that too far removed from restaurants? <laughs> no, that's great. And with the Lotus Roots in Sichuan, if I could make a recommendation, uh, so uh, there's a really popular dish where you slice a piece of lotus root, which kind of looks a little bit like Swiss cheese. To so some people, it's got like a couple of holes in it, but it's a really like crisp, um, I'm going to call it a vegetable. And then if you put a little bit of pork meat, if, uh, if you are able to eat meat in between two slices of that and then coat it uh, in a little bit of like flour or something and fry it, it becomes almost like a fried lotus dumpling. It's excellent. And it's a very popular. <laughs> now, your question was about the model minority. Um, so that is a concept that's been used by historians to explain this really big shift from the exclusion era before 1945 to the post-war era where the exclusion acts are repealed slowly. And then suddenly you start to see these popular, largely positive stereotypes about Chinese Americans, okay? Um, and so there's a number of uh, authors that have written about how that shifts. And I'm looking around behind me to see if I can easily pull down one of those books um, that would be useful. Sorry, my office is a mess. It's almost the beginning of the semester. But essentially you have like 
um, this influx of this different class of Chinese immigrants, and I say class uh, with specific purpose, they come from different areas. Almost all Chinese immigrants pre-1945 come from Guangzhou in Southern China. And in fact, something like 80% come from one county known as Taishan, okay? And some of them do quite well economically. They make enough money in the United States as owners of laundries or as uh, grocers, importers, as merchants to like buy homes, to launch their own businesses back home, to pay for their kids, to get education, et cetera, et cetera. But by and large, they come from people who are inside of Chinese society seen as kind of more towards the bottom rungs of society. They don't come from this scholar gentry class of well-to-do families. After 1945, with the repeal of Chinese Exclusion Acts, with the communist revolution and civil war that leaves the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, both claiming to represent the Chinese people, you start to see people who are coming over from a more elite class of Chinese society and a different geographic area. And they're not headed to live in kind of discriminate, uh, discriminated against communities like Chinatowns, they head for American universities, they head for suburbs, they head for urban areas like Cincinnati, in part because they have college degrees and they have very, very high professional qualifications. And some of them really stand out in American culture. There's several like Nobel Prize winning physicists that migrate from China to the United States after 1945. And actors and actresses and authors like Jade Snow Wong. So these really, really highly successful people come to represent the Chinese American community. And that's where a lot of that pushback that you reference comes from is because even though these people are seen as representative and fulfilling the Chinese American dream, it's in part kind of like what we were talking about with Charlie Yi. It's just one sliver of his story. Well, these people are just one sliver of that community. Not every Chinese American or Asian American for that matter ends up at Harvard, even though American popular culture starts representing them as all really, really high academic achievers. We're all really, really, really um, commercially successful people. Uh, so that's a little bit of where that comes from. Uh, Still looking for one of my good books. But author and historian Madeline Sue has written about this the most, if you're interested in that. And if you want, you can always uh, email me at Hanover College and I'll send you a, a good bibliography to walk you through that. But that's kind of the, the short version of what's happening. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, and then my husband had a question and his favorite food is Dine Dine noodles too, like yours. <laughs> but he was wondering, like, is there any correlation to like where different cuisines from China came into the U.S. and like where they settled and the type of food that they brought with them? Yeah. So again, so uh, here our best author for understanding this is Haiming Liu's book, okay? And he talks about how there's all these different regional variations, right, of, China, of Chinese cuisine. Some talk about like there's eight different regions of Chinese cuisine. Some talk about 12 different schools of Chinese cuisine, okay? But everything's determined by localism, right, the environment. And China is really, really geographically diverse, okay? So it has all these different areas. But since so many immigrants pre-1945 are coming from that one area, those areas of Guangdong and Guangzhou, and a lot from Taishan, what we're ending up with is Southern Chinese food. And what they come here finding is that Americans consume two things in the 19th century in larger quantities than anyone else in the world. Can anyone guess what those two things are that Americans eat more of than anywhere else in the world? Beef? I don't know. <laughs> beef? Beef is right. 
Beef and sugar, meat and sugar. And so to adjust Chinese cuisine from the Southern region to meet American expectations, you start to see more sugar introduced into those dishes and the use of more meat. Whereas traditionally, even across all those different regional cuisines, Chinese say, Tan Tai. Tan is a reference a lot of times to, to rice, like mi fan. Mi fan is a word for rice. But fan actually means any kind of grain. It could be wheat noodles or millet or baked goods like pancakes and jambang and those types of things. But it's essentially saying that what comes first in Chinese cooking, even across all those different regions, is like the grain. What matters most is the noodles, the rice. And the meat or the cooked vegetables, the thai, okay, that's really just to like flavor things. It's just to add a little spice in there, okay? It's to change the dish. But that's kind of flipped as they start to cater to American businesses. So pre-1945, what we're largely getting from China is Southern food, and it's catering to American interests so that their businesses will be more successful. So it has more meat, it has more sugar, and that's how we end up with these really sugary dishes um, uh, and a lot of fried dishes and things like that. Now, all those different regions after 1945, and especially in the 1970s, like we're saying with Mike Wong, then you start to see regional variations brought over. And that's when we get Sichuan and Hunan coming. And then others, such as Dim Sum, which is Southeastern kind of region of Chinese cooking around Shanghai. And that's in part because Shanghai is exploding again on the international scene in the 1980s and 1990s as a major port of trade and kind of a commercial gateway to mainland China. So some of this is driven by changing immigration and economics, where people come from. And then also what is popular, not just with Americans, but throughout China as well. These are some of the most popular regional cuisines that we see. Whereas sometimes Dongbei food, which is Northern food near Beijing, um, is a little bit more difficult uh, to appeal, not just to the rest of the world, but to other areas of China. Uh, it features a lot of very pungent uh, flavors sometimes, or difficult textures like uh, cow tripe or in intestines. Uh, that was kind of a long rambling answer. I love talking about food and regional variations, uh, and I'd be happy to talk more about Dan Dan Mian. I have a pretty good recipe of myself. Oh, really? Can we write to you and get that? <laughs> yep. Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, well, I have a different question. Um, so have Uyghurs come here? Is there like a Uyghur cuisine, and is that present in the U.S.? So we the Uyghur's food... Um, in the 90s and 2000s just explodes. You get all kinds of Uyghurs migrating out of their home province in Xinjiang and spreading out across China to all these cities uh, in the 1990s and 2000s. So it becomes really popular with people living in China in that period as well. Um, it's just very delicious breads, um, barbecued lamb uh, and kebabs and things like that. And then some of the most delicious noodles too. There is, I believe, a Uyghur uh, restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio, if you're in the Midwest, and another in Washington, D.C. Um, in part because outward migration of Uyghurs has been stymied and is much more controlled than Han Chinese, I would say that is one reason why that has not quite spread or caught on. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So do you ever lead food tours of China? <laughs> oh, no, I couldn't possibly. Um, so one thing that Haiming really discusses is how important talking about food is to Chinese culture. When we look at Chinese culture going way back into the Tang Dynasty, so like 8th and 9th century AD or Common Era, we have like uh, 
menus for royal banquets that are like over 80 dishes long. And Chinese literature, uh, novels and books and plays that are hundreds of years old, such as like Dreams of the Red Chamber, you have extended scenes where people are talking endlessly about food and how it should be cooked and how delicious it is. Um, so for me to kind of engage in any kind of talk about those things, it would, it would be foolhardy. But when I take students over, which I haven't done over the last couple of years because of COVID, to China, I do take them to some of my favorite restaurants, which includes the best Uyghur restaurant in Beijing, which the joke there is everybody that lives in Beijing as a foreigner claims that they know the best Uyghur restaurant and place to get it in Beijing. And it's always different. But mine really is the best. I, I take students to these places and then I usually turn them over to a friend or I turn them over to the restaurant owner to, to kind of talk about the food and how things are cooked. But if, if you want a tour in Chinese, uh, if you want a tour of Cincinnati and Oxford, I'm pretty good. Uh, if you get in the Cincinnati area, there's a place called Sichuan Chili, which if spicy food is your thing, they make their own hot chili sauce. It's a beautiful. Dan Dan Mian is excellent there, but their their dumplings, their gong bao ji ding, their yu sheng chiedza, which is an eggplant dish. Those they're they're just the best. And then if you like hand pulled or homemade noodles, down by the University of Cincinnati's campus, you would find Fortune Noodle, uh, and those are really interesting families as well. They'll take a lot of time to get to know you and tell you their story. They're really cool people. Hey, thank you. Uh, Nihama, ah. I, was, yeah, I was wondering, um, is uh, chop suey based on a, a Chinese dish like a, in China? And if so, what are the, the similarities and differences between the American version and the Chinese version? That's really good. Um, that's a question that historians have loved to debate. Uh, there was lots of different origin stories for chop suey. One of the most famous is that a, an emissary of the, the Qing Empire, Li Hongzhong, comes over and he's sent on this mission to the United States to talk about America's unequal treaties, to try and broker some educational exchanges that will allow Chinese to come to universities in the United States. And then just all together to try and kind of impress the American people to produce a more favorable impression of the Qing Empire. Uh, it's, it's said that he kind of ordered the dish and invented it. But in actuality, a lot of scholars say, uh, a lot of people were prone to saying at first, in the first round of historical interpretations, that really there was no um, chop suey. Does that make sense that there was no dish that resembled that? in any of the regional cuisines. Yeah, and that's what I of thought was that like it just, there's so many Chinese foods that just kind of seem similar that it's not really like an original dish. More recently, some people have started to defend it of like, yeah, but you know, like a lot of, uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of working class Chinese in the early 20th century and a lot of peasant families would have had dishes where they just throw anything into it, which if you look chop suey, a lot of times was what, what was ever left mixed with noodles. It was kind of almost like Cracker Jacks of like, what do we have left over? And it was just thrown all together. So there's been some people that have defended that like, it is not an actual dish, but it is a, a practice within Chinese cooking. Does that make sense? Like it's, yeah. it doesn't resemble a dish, but it resembles how people would have just thrown anything together to try and make something at the end of a week. They would have thrown all the leftovers together. Okay. I had kind of a, a side question too. I was wondering if uh, you ever got to try any of the, the like local craft beers in, uh, in Beijing, like Great Leap Forward or was the other one like Aging Brewing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm not as good with beer, but my my wife knows that city better. Well, she knew it from 2012 to 2015. It's changed so much. Yeah. But she loved both great. Well, at one point, there was three great leaps. There was the old like one in the courtyards 
um, that just had like fried peanuts, which were really good with their beers. Then she loved the pizza place and the one that was like a burger place. And then she liked aging. A lot of our friends had the mugs. There was one other one that I think was called Steamboat when we were yeah, there. Yeah, there was, um, which I think started in Shanghai, but moved there like boxing caps. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you, are, there, um, are there more? <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a ton. There is actually coming up in October. I wanted, I've been to one before um, a few years ago, but there's actually a great um, brewery festival called uh, eight by eight and they take eight chinese craft breweries and they every year it's different they choose eight breweries from around the world yeah and then they uh they pair up and they make collaboration beers together and then they have a big uh beer fest with it in that art district in uh beijing oh wow and seven nine eight yeah seven i was trying to think of the numbers yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. So how long did you live in Beijing or how do you get to visit? Uh, I was down in um, in Jiangsu province for a few years. So and I would go to Beijing semi regularly. So good for you. That's excellent. But, and did you have a, fa a favorite dish? Uh, I always liked, um, what was it? Uh, Tudo Nero Gaimian. Oh, all right. That's cool. Yeah which was one of my go-tos um, a lot of times. I like a lot of the, the noodle stuff, so. Yeah. Spicy stuff, not so much. Yeah, yeah, okay. Excellent. Well, thank you for your question. And yeah, great leap. If, if any of you all get to, to Beijing, uh, he's on to it. Beijing's coming in, in world and craft beers. They, they do good work there. So if, if you like beer, Great Leap is a good place to start and then try out all the other ones because there's some really exciting things happening with Chinese beers. Yeah. Um, I did see one thing in the chat earlier. Uh, Camilla said for their favorite dish, we love orange chicken. It's the dish we order every at every Chinese restaurant. It sets the standard of how good a Chinese restaurant is. Um, do you know anything about the or origins of orange chicken? Is it similar to chop suey where it's combining our <laughs> Midwestern love of meat and sugar <laughs> into a dish that sells well, or does it have origins in Chinese, traditional Chinese cuisine? Okay, so I'm doing this now too. There was an excellent documentary on General Cho's chicken that for a while was on uh, Netflix. So I'm linking to a page for that too, for people that are interested in these types of questions. Now, this one, I can only say I have seen people debate privately and that uh, some say that this is also a common practice, that it wasn't just for, uh, like that it's not also related to a dish, um, but, here the contention too is like general Cho's chicken that it actually came back to china so fast that it was actually something that was maybe developed for american audiences and then brought back to southern china by chinese americans or chinese immigrants returning with their families that it was like a dish that was developed in the united states then spread throughout southern china in the early 20th century and also became popular in places like taiwan in the 1940s and 1950s because it was served to an influx of Americans, but also Chinese in Taiwan also took to it. And so then it almost became indigenous. Does that make sense? Versus chop suey and things like, uh, like the crab rangoon have never really like gone back home to China and taken off. But orange chicken um, is one that uh, in some restaurants, uh, especially in like the South uh, or in Taiwan, I've heard you can find. Uh, Jeremy just asked, was there an actual general so? <laughs> like a historical figure or, yeah. or like the dish? Oh, I guess either. either historical or. figure. There we go. <laughs> uh, I can't remember, but I know they talk about that in the film. The film's really good. Um, the film's really exciting. And especially if, 
um, one of the most exciting questions is like authenticity, right? And that's probably one of the most interesting things to me as a historian is how one wave of immigrants can sometimes jeopardize the preceding wave's claims to authenticity. Uh, for instance, in my chapter from this book, the influx of all these restaurants after 2008, like Tong Dynasty, really, really put pressure on an older Chinese American restaurant, Fan Xin, which in the 1980s was seen as being very, very authentic because they brought a regional cuisine and dishes like Sichuan and Hunan cuisine. And they would sell things like mooncakes in the 1990s and 2000s to people around Chinese holidays. But then with Tong Dynasty coming and them saying, you know, we're, we're featuring things like hot pot, huo guo. If, if we're selling that to customers and handmade noodles and our, and our menu is all in Mandarin characters, then those people were undermined. And so like even to have something like General Cho's Chicken to those people who are running restaurants like Tang Dynasty or to have anything like chop suey or egg rolls to them, that's like, then you're not being authentic at all. So from their perspective, uh, General Cho's The Dish is like wholly made up. But this documentary dives into how it's much more complicated. Uh, a lot of dishes, uh, including Gong Bao Jideng and Tan Dan Mian, have origin stories that are often linked to a famous figure from Chinese history. Uh, but we don't actually know if that, that person actually ate those things or invented those things in part because that was just often a way to market them to people. Uh, so General Cho, uh, I think, is a dish where people would say, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm winding away from the question there. Uh, go to the film to answer that, Jeremy. You'll get a more definitive answer than what I'm giving you here. But the overarching premise behind a lot of our questions about authenticity that's something that's just always difficult to do in part because a new generation comes in and they redefine it. And also consumers do it. Consumers come into our restaurants and come with expectations about food and what's gonna count as real Chinese food and what no longer counts. And that changes from era to era. And it changes a lot of times based on that relationship between the producer and the consumer. 